Okay, everyone. It is 9 a.m. literally Japan time now. I think we can get started because we have a very full schedule today. As we wait for others to chime in, I'll just start from some general introduction. So hi again, and we're so honored to have um, Aaron Rio joining us today, and Megan will introduce him more. Um, so I'll just start from the Zoom functions. So as you all know, uh, by courtesy, please mute yourself and, and change your display name, name yourself by first name, last name, and IUC graduation year. Okay, I, I'll do that later, sorry. <laughs> And so here's the IUC and the Night Talk Organization Committee uh, for this event. So we have Richard, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi everyone, thanks for joining. I graduated in 2003. I think I know lots of people here. Um, looking forward to today's event. And Megan? Hi everyone, I finished IUC in 2020. Um, this is my first time being the interviewer. So thank you in advance for your uh, for coming and thank you in advance for your patience with me. And I'm Tarani, I graduated in 2019, right before the pandemic, so lucky. And here we go to the next slide. So here's the IUC alumni talk. Basically um, it's a web series that aims to celebrate a space for IUC alumni network to share their personal journeys with each other and the um, the interest of the public. So we actually started during the pandemic and I, me myself learned a lot from all these talks and really enjoy um, this talk. I'm so looking forward to, to uh, today's interview. So here's the past speaker. So we featured many past alumni uh, in their different stage uh, stages of their career and from different years. And we try to balance gender and nationality, et cetera. Yes, so uh, Aaron will be our 11th speaker. Cool, and we would also like to thank the past IUC Alumni Talk Organization Committee members. Without them, um, we won't be here. So um, people joining us and leave, and we all, we all have different bandwidth. But yeah, we really want to give credit to them and acknowledge their um, effort. And before we start, I would also like to announce um, the call for ap applications for next year's IUC, uh, which will start in September 4th till uh, June 7th, 2024. And Richard will drop a link to the chat um, for the call for application. And we also have the QR code. So if you want to scan the QR code, now it's your chance to do so. Okay, now, pass the stage to Megan. All right. So today it's my pleasure to welcome Aaron Rio as our speaker. Um, Aaron is associate curator in the Department of Asian Art um, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, specializing in medieval and early modern Japanese painting. He previously served as Andrew W. Mellon, associate curator of Japanese and Korean art at the Minneapolis Institute of Art. And he earned his PhD from Columbia in 2015. Um, having studied art history myself, it's really an honor to interview someone with so much expertise. Um, so Aaron, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us tonight, uh, this morning in Japan. My pleasure. And thank you um, to the organizing committee. It's It's been fun to, to put it together. I hope everyone tonight has as much fun as we've had talking about this. So with that, let's get started. Um, most of the people we've had on the alumni talks had some kind of encounter with Japan in their childhood or during high school, but um, I understand that wasn't the case with you. What was it? What got you interested in Japan? Uh, yeah, um, I, I sometimes forget that I didn't have a, um, a lifelong interest in Japan, I suppose, but um, I, I stumbled across Japan um, as um, an undergraduate at Indiana University Bloomington, where I was studying creative writing, um, poetry specifically, and bassoon performance. And um, and at some point, I, um, um, I I was able to take a course on Chinese painting and um, fell in love with the subject, and eventually found my way to Japan. But um, the image on the screen is is the first the first example of um, 
East Asian painting I'd ever seen before in my entire life. It was, it, I walked into the class on the first day of this Chinese painting course. It was called um, um, Landscapes of the Mind, uh, Chinese landscape painting. And it was taught by just an extraordinary uh, scholar of, of Chinese painting named Susan Nelson um, nearing retirement when I was there. And this was just on the screen in this wonderful lecture hall um, in a you know pitch black old fashioned art history um, lecture hall. And I had no idea what I was looking at. Uh, I didn't recognize it as a mountain. Um, and I remember just finding that endlessly fascinating um, uh, that, that I could be taught to see something that, to see something in a piece of paper, or in this case, a piece of silk with you know some ink smeared on it, however you want, you know, <laughs> however it's applied. Um, that's all it is. It's a piece of silk with ink on it, but you can look at it and see endless mountains and, and you can see Northern Song Chinese history if you would like and, and you know, whatever you want to see into it, you can, but um, I found that fascinating. And, and so that's what I, that's, that's, I changed my focus entirely at that point. That is fascinating. So your entry point to Japan was Chinese art. Um, how did you go from Chinese art to Japan? Um, the same professor, um, you know, sort of encouraged me to think about Chinese painting uh, in Japan um, uh, to, you know, study Japanese and think about collections of Chinese painting in Japan, which is a subject that hadn't been as as studied um, or wasn't wasn't being studied by a younger generation of scholars um, coming of age at that time. And so I did that um, at her advice. <laughs> And um, and so I started studying Japanese and um, started thinking about um, other things. And then when I finished college, I ended up um, uh, moving to Japan uh, for the JET program after having a couple of um, um, different kinds of experiences with Japan as a, as a student. But I moved to, to the place on the screen right now, which is this um, wonderful um, um, place called Sonimura in the, in the countryside of Nara. I understand that your JET was like, a real bona fide Inaka experience. Could you tell us a little bit about the beautiful majestic landscape in front of us? Um, it was great. <laughs> it was just <laughs> the best experience of my entire life so far. Um, uh, I was I was 22 and I this was before, um, I know it doesn't seem like that long ago. I'm not that old, but, but we did not have Google Maps back then. <laughs> I promise so, you. 2004? And, um, it was 2004, yeah, and I, I remember sitting in in southern Indiana at my parents' house trying to figure out where Sony Murdo was on a map, and I couldn't find it. Um, and and I so I showed up in in Osaka Kansai Airport, and and three hours later, I I found myself in the middle of in the middle of the Key Peninsula. Um, uh, this village is is um, it's about an hour by car east of the city of Kashihara, in 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 the middle of Nara Prefecture. Um, and it, it's an it's an Igano Kuni. It's a it's a it's a sacred, rich, beautiful land, you know. Um, uh, and it's just right across the mountain from Muro, uh, where this wonderful uh, early um, Buddhist temple is. And so I was hiking a lot, and I was going to local Buddhist temples and 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 um, thinking about Buddhist art when I was there. I understand you were the only English speaker in the area. Well, there was a well, there was a um, there was a um, a British guy who was a friend of mine who lived in a village about 30, 30 minutes away. But the two of us, yeah, yeah. Wow, uh, I what grade did you teach at Jet? Would you were you teaching high school, middle school? I taught um, uh, from grade one to um, uh, whatever the oldest grade of, of Japanese middle school is, the equivalent of grade a uh, freshman in high school at, at, in the states. Um, so nine years, I suppose. Um, the, every single student in the entire village at both the elementary school and at, at the junior high school um, took English every single day because it was a wow. it was a pilot school um, um, at that time when they were when they were thinking about implementing. Um, I don't I don't know what it is like now, but they were thinking about implementing English education um, at at the earliest levels um, on a daily as part of the daily curriculum. And you told me that your first year class only had two kids yeah oh <laughs> and, one, and one of them was the daughter of my advisor <laughs> oh my god <laughs> little hazuki <-chan. laughs> wow. it, was, it was wonderful I mean it was I, I I it was just I was living in the most beautiful magical place in the world 
with the nicest people on the planet, um, learning Japanese and hiking and running around the mountains and playing with just playing. I was I was playing. I felt like a big kid. It was amazing. <laughs> and you had to leave that playing after your yeah. two years. And then you went to you started your PhD at Columbia which is most certainly not playing. <laughs> no, um, no, it wasn't playing. <laughs> I understand that you started Columbia studying Chinese art. Is that right? Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily describe it that way. I had not properly studied Japanese art when I entered the program at Columbia, but there was a sense that that's what I was doing because I had been in Japan and I spoke, you know, I spoke decent Japanese after having lived there for a while um, and decent. studied minimally, but um, yeah. But I, but Chinese, there was no one teaching Japanese art when I arrived. So what led you to IUC? Um, the same reason, there was no one teaching Japanese art when I arrived. And so, and so the decision was made to, to ship me off to Japan. And, and for, um, so I found something else to do for a year. And um, um, one of the, one of the um, things that happened when I was living in Sony for two years was that my Japanese, I, I, I spoke, entirely in Kansai Ben. Um, and it isn't just, it isn't just normal Kansai Ben. It's, it's, it's sort of um, uh, Nara and Mie Ben, a very specific version of Kansai Ben. Um, and, and so there was an effort to um, um, de-Kansai my, my Japanese at that point. And that was part of the, that was part of the reason to go to IUC. Let's see, so um, tell us a little bit about your time at IUC. Um, which senseis did you work with the most? Uh, and I'd also like to hear about your final hapio. Um, my first, uh, I have a, I have a bad memory um, for for nearly everything except for medieval Japanese paintings. <laughs> but so I'll get this wrong. But but I think I think the memory serves. My first um, uh, senseis were Akizawa sensei and Otake sensei. Um, I remember have very 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 clear memories of of intonation practice with Akizawa sensei, which was mind blowing to me. And um, Otake Sensei, um, who um, <laughs> terrified the living daylights, uh, daylights out of me in class, was just the kindest person imaginable and spent a lot of time with me after class and after the end of the day studying wa and ga. Um, just how I just I just couldn't figure it out. I think I still probably haven't figured it out, but she spent countless hours trying to help me understand. Um, and and going through my sakobun and things like that. But then um, once you know the focus changes to you know your your sort of simmon, um, I I uh, met Kushida Kiyomi Sensei, who I think is here tonight. And um, and and then and then it was it was it was wonderful. I I, I learned everything about everything um, uh, while studying Japanese with, with Kushida Sensei. Yeah, I. I sadly never got to work with Kushida Sensei, so I had to subject um, Komine Sensei to diagrams of bamboo cameras and scandalous Meiji prints. So <laughs> it must have been so nice to get that kind of. A, a lot of IUC students, I think, really benefit not just from the grammar, the wa, the gua, and the intonation, but also like a scholar in the field who can introduce you to like primary sources. And yeah, yeah, so, I, I think that Kushida Sensei. Um, you know, very, very different backgrounds, very different interests within the field of, within the fields of, you know, visual culture, art history, but um, uh, was just knew sort of how to encourage and, and help um, and, and was really, really good about helping with academic reading. Um, for me, that was the most, the most beneficial part of it was um, 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 working with her on, on, on secondary sources in Japanese. I understand me too. When I, if I may personally add something, when I went to IUC, I was very shy about my academic reading skills. Uh, I didn't need to worry about my Kansai Ben, although I was chastised that my sensei sounded too much like Kansai Ben. <laughs> um, but I understand that they worked with you a lot on your research and your Hapio had something to do with your research projects you were doing back at Columbia, right? Yeah, so um, all of my research basically um, from the very beginning is somehow tied to this notion of um, syncretic um, religious images uh, in Japan, and um, that's what I was doing. So my final hapio was this just ridiculous um, attempt to, um, I'm not even going to repeat it, but it was, it, was, it, was, it was an attempt to come up with a theory about, about syncretic images, and I, it, was, it was not a good theory, but I, um, I've 
I've since um, um, uh, I've, I've continued to work on it, and I'm still thinking about it to this very day. Could I ask, what's the quick definition of syncretic images? Oh, so um, uh, um, can we move on to this painting in the middle of the screen, Megan? Is that okay if I? Yeah, of course, of course. Make mention of this. So, for example, um, um, this image is a Zen Buddhist devotional image. In other words, it was used in a in a monastic context, um, uh, a ritual context, with a Buddhist deity in the middle, flanked by um, clearly Chinese figures. In this case, um, these are Chinese poets. Um, um, at the right, there's a poet Taoyu Ming from the fourth century, and at the left, there's a poet, a, a poet Li Bai from the eighth century. Neither one of them is Buddhist, but they're being recast as Buddhists here in this in this context. In fact, it's um, this is the merging of quote unquote three creeds: Buddhism, Taoism, and Confucianism in a single image, um, it, within a specific Zen Buddhist context. But this is the kind of thing that I I find endlessly fascinating. Yeah, no, that is really fascinating. And earlier you said there weren't too many examples or not too many people, young people studying, you know, Chinese art vis-a-vis -vis Japan. So this is like doubly interesting, I think. Um, A lot of people have studied Chinese Chinese painting vis-a-vis -vis Japan. It's and 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 Chinese art has been studied was studied sort of first in in Japan in many ways in the modern period. The the history of Chinese painting is written in Japan in some ways. Um, but the history of Japanese art inside Japan is different than the history of Japanese art elsewhere, right? Japan has its own notion of, of Chinese art and Chinese painting. And that's what I'm interested in is, 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 is that the sort of status of Chinese painting inside Japan. I see. Yeah. So IUC really, you know, helped you get to the reading to that. And then you left IUC in 2009 and went back to Columbia and finished your coursework. And then you returned to Japan for a few years um, to do research for your dissertation into this. Um, can you tell us about, well, you've introduced it to us, but could you tell us a little bit more about your dissertation and the type of research you did? Um, for those not familiar, with your field, does this mean you spent a lot of time in archives? Were you going to a lot of museum galleries, doing interviews? Yeah, so um, this painting that we're looking at is was the sort of heart of of, of my research. It still is, but it's always it was always a pursuit about this particular painting. But in order to get at the stuff of it, I I, I needed to figure out who it was by, and when it was when it was painted, and all of that. And um, and so my dissertation ended up being about um, primarily about the artist. Um, whose name is typically associated with this painting, although I don't believe it was by him, doesn't really matter. Um, and and then and then the place where he was active, which was Kamakura, the city of Kamakura in the Muromachi period. Um, Kamakura was the the cradle of Zen Buddhism in Japan, and this particular painter um, was active at the the premier Zen temple in Kamakura. It's Kenchoji, which was the first you know authentically Chinese style Zen monastery created in Japan in the um, second half of the 13th century. And so I, I, I spent my, my time in Japan um, doing archival research and visiting temples and museums and seeing um, um, altogether, it was ended up being about, you know, around, you know, it was a hundred or so paintings that, that I had to see firsthand and, and um, that ended up appearing in the dissertation, just to sort of tell a story about um, this type of painting and, and how we got to this point. And how did you find your way to these 100 images? Were you, um, did the, I understand you were at Todai and Gakushui, did they, you know, introduce you to people? Or I understand that your advisor from Columbia maybe helped get you in touch with some people to um, show you some of these works. Definitely, I, I, all those things. Um, uh, advisors at Columbia, advisors at Todai, advisors at Gakushui. And then at the end of the day, you sort of, you have your own skills that you learn at the IUC to fall back on right all those classes on letter writing and um contacting people sure came in handy when i was contacting dealers and 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 collectors and saying gosh i'd really like to see that random old browning painting you've got in your closet or whatever it is you know <laughs> it came in handy and i and i, I i'm a, i was a bit brazen about it i think um, um i would i would just sort of reach out to anyone and probably broke all kinds of um, rules but I saw a lot of stuff. So. Yeah, no, that's really amazing. And 
But what isn't it exactly about Kamakura that, you know, was so enchanting to you? I don't, I don't necessarily even know that Kamakura as a place was enchanting to me, um, but it's Kamakura is fascinating to me as a site of, 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 of something novel in the, at the end of the 13th century. And what happens in the case of Kamakura is, you know, Japanese culture moves on um, Japanese history moves on from from Kamakura in 1333, and certainly by the end of the 14th century, what was once a rich cosmopolitan city, Kamakura was one of the largest cities on the planet, right? In in in, in the in the 12th century, it was it was cosmopolitan. There, it was it was it was it was it was like Hangzhou, right? Yeah. In China, and and yet by the 1380s, there was nothing really there. Um, there was a sort of mass exodus of a brain drain from Kamakura. The painters were gone. You know, the poets were gone. The 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 sort of rising stars of the of the Zen community had left. Um, there was no political institution there anymore. It was just you know local warlords and things, and it was isolated. And so I studied the painters who sort of stuck around, the leftovers in Kamakura for for a couple of centuries actually actually. And you see painters who just continue to engage with this, the, the materials that were left, the residue of that of that golden age. Um, and that's what I find interesting and fascinating and magical and, and I can't get enough of it. Yeah, no, that is really interesting. And so then these paintings, you know, being devotional paintings, they were mostly hung in temples, right? How, how was the process of commissioning these like historically? Like who, who, oh. asked, to, who asked to make this painting? Well, so I um my my theory is that this painting was created inside a monastic workshop, actually. Um and that that's sort of the 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 thrust of my of my research is is trying to demonstrate that this doesn't have a seal or signature on it. It isn't um it's associated with a specific painter, but more likely it was created by an anonymous anonymous painter working at a temple workshop. Um but that person had certain things at his disposal. To, he could only see certain things. You know, this is before mechanical reproduction. These are just, yeah. you have to go look at a thing to copy it, to recreate it. And so he he's living in this environment in Kamakura at this temple. He's surrounded by Chinese paintings that have been collected there 100 years or 200 years before. And then in the middle of the 15th century, someone without a name painted this incredible triptych um, without a title on it. You know, we don't know what, it, he, we don't know who it was or what he thought about it you just look at it, know what it is, you know, no one left, no one leaves a clue that says, this is Taoyuan and Ming Li Bai and, and, and the white robe condo and sitting, you just sort of, you have to figure it out. And it all lives inside you, the image. How do you figure it out? It all lives inside the image, right? <laughs> so the, the Taoyuan and Ming iconography, the, the figure of a man standing at a sort of a, 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 a river's edge, there are little chrysanthemums at the at the riverbank, which means that he's at the eastern edge of his own property. Um, and this is the um, uh, fifth poem on drinking wine um, from a set of 20 by Taoyu and Ming from the fourth century. This is a single, this illustrates a couplet from, from a fourth century Chinese poet. Um, the left painting illustrates a couplet from an eighth century poet by Li Bai. And they're, they're tied by their um, geography, they're tied by um, um, you know, there are sort of poetic associations. Um, it's an incredibly rich image. And just the fact that it could exist anywhere at any time is magical, but to, I, I'm just trying to figure out why then and, and, and how, why does it look the way that it does, et cetera. No, that is really interesting. And like you said, it just needs so much, you know, knowledge going into the creation of it and the knowledge on the viewer's part to understand. And it's this complicated interweaving um, so it's really a testament to the breadth of the knowledge and skills, not just, you know, the artist and commissioner needs, but that you need as, you know, the viewer to break down and then you explain why it's so amazing to us and this kind of breaking down and explaining things to us eager viewers, I think transitions into your current work as a curator. And I've been dying to ask, how did you get started as a curator? Um, I, I spent my last year um, of writing my dissertation in residence at the Met as a fellow, um, and I was just there as a, you know, doing research, but I had a sort of behind the scenes look at what was going on and 
I fell in love with being able to go to storage and see art in person, frankly. After four years in Japan doing field work and looking at paintings in person, I went, oh, you mean I could get a job where I get to <laughs> see things myself all the time, whenever I want? Of course, it doesn't work that way. But but that that is what drew me to wanting to be a curator. And so um, while I was in residence at the Met, I applied for jobs and accepted one at the um, Minneapolis Institute of Art, which is a large regional museum with a substantial collection of Japanese um, art uh, um, in the upper Midwest of the United States. And I understand you, we have a few images from exhibits you prepared at Minneapolis. Um, could you maybe walk us through them a little? Yeah, so when I, I first arrived in Japan, um, uh, knowing nothing more than what I just described to you, which is essentially nothing about uh, <laughs> a little bit of medieval um, Japan and its ink, ink paintings. Um, and the first thing I was asked to do was create this exhibition on a um, recently deceased um, um, modern Japanese ink painter, um, Japanese Chinese actually, he was a Chinese born Japanese uh, ink painter. And so I did a retrospective on his work called Boundless Peaks. And it was just, uh, I mean, it was just mind blowing in the sense that um, I had never thought that that would be the first thing I would be asked to do. <laughs> going, going from medieval ink painting to contemporary, I'm sure. You want me to do what about what? I think it was probably the first thing I said to the director of the museum when, when she told me that would be my, my first task. <laughs> and you want me to write a book about it too? <laughs> But so. I understand you also had other works that, you know, went beyond ink painting, went beyond the medium and went beyond time. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. The, the museum is, um, uh, um, uh, it, it was a lot of fun to be there. And so I got to do a lot of experimenting in the permanent galleries. Um, this picture at left is actually a, a, a collaborative reinstallation of their uh, Buddhist sculpture hall. And we put on view in the Buddhist sculpture hall along alongside you know, ancient Chinese and, and Japanese and Indonesian sculptures, this uh, contemporary work by a Japanese um, um, art, uh, artist named Kondo Takahiro. This is his own uh, sort of model of his own body um, as he meditates, but it's made of porcelain and it, he uses this glaze that makes it look as if he's, I mean, sweating. It's, it's an incredibly intense object and it's life-size. And then on the right is just a picture of an exhibition we did of the um, um, some pictures of the tale of Genji. That's my co-curator and exhibition designer standing in the picture there. Actually, it was. It's just it, that this is the kind of thing that I, that we that I do. No, it takes a lot of research to do all this, right? Uh, you have to research yeah. the objects and then decide how to put them together and display them. Um, yeah, one wishes you had more time for research, but um, yeah, it so certainly does. If you don't have more time for research, what else do you do as a curator? Then, if I may ask. Um. You do um, exhibitions on <laughs> contemporary ceramics when you're asked to. <laughs> um, no, it's just sometimes it's, you know, sometimes there are interests, certain groups have interests or certain communities have interest. This Minneapolis has a, has a rich history um, um, of a sort of rich interest in ceramics, especially Japanese ceramics. And so um, it was meaningful to, to do an exhibition of contemporary ceramics in that particular community. And so I just, I happened, I, there are these pictures are of an exhibition I did right before I left there in 2019. Of, um, of works by women artists um, responding directly to natural motifs and themes. And then, and then um, I think the next slide shows a very different part of my job. <laughs> so yes, then besides well, exhibitions, um, um, buying art, collecting art is the other, um, one of the other buckets in my, that, I, that I handle. Um, and so I, you know, I bought a number of things for Minneapolis, but when I came to the Met in, in 2020, this was the um, the very first thing that I that I presented to the Met for purchase was this uh, pair of screens um, that I had seen in Japan as a student in 20, 2008, maybe. I think I was probably at IUC at the time, <laughs> but I had what? visited a dealer um, just as a student and wanted to study and saw this pair of screens. And then when I came to the Met, I sought it out. And, and now it's uh, now it's in the Met's collection. And how do you convince the Met to buy something? Research. You know, you have to convince them that it's that it's real, that 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 you're the authority, and that that it is um, worth the expenditure, that it's worth the time and effort, um, that it fits in the collection, that it adds something important to the collection, that it can be shown, um, that we have a context for, that we can take care of it, 
all those things um, um, uh, come to bear on the decision that ultimately gets made by the um, the institution, right? The curator is just just the person who says, "I think this is great. I think this is wonderful, and 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 we should buy this." And are there extra steps you have to do when you're buying something from Japan? Yes, yeah, of course. Um, uh, export um, processes are really important anytime you're buying something internationally. Yeah. Um, so what this this that? came from a Japanese dealer, of course, and and you uh, the buyer doesn't apply for export; the seller applies for export in Japan, and so um, it's exported as as a as a work of art for sale. Wow, I see. And so you have to like convince kind of not just the Met, but or whichever museum you're at, but also kind of convince on the Japan side too, in a way. No, would, that's no. not the 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 buyer no. doesn't have a role to play there because it's oh, it, it's a government process. The the um the um uh, bunkacho decides what gets exported or not. Oh, I see. I see. If you go to the um, next slide, there's a we can talk about something yes. more interesting. <laughs> Your next exciting acquisition. This was this was fun. Um, uh, right before COVID. Um, this painting was exhibited in Japan, and I had a chance to see it in person a couple of times. And um, then we had it sent over to the Met a couple of years ago um, to study because it was a recently rediscovered work, a recently rediscovered masterpiece by a really important painter called Kano Masanobu, who's the founder of the Kano School, um, which you know just sort of dominated Japanese painting for for four centuries after the end of the fifteenth century. Um, go to the next slide if you would. So we, um, you know, not not being absolutely certain what it was, but um, you know, understanding it to be a really important and powerful work, we brought it in, and we had scientists pour over it, and conservators, and we figured out how it was made, and we tested it, and we did all kinds of things. So you're looking at this painting on the left here. This image is 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 showing it with light shining through the back. So you see all these little um, black lines on the surface. Do you see all that? What yeah. those are are crease repairs, where this 500-year-old piece of paper has been rolled up as a scroll so many times, and it creates creases on the surface. And then inside the object are embedded all these tiny little pieces of paper that you know you can sort of trace the history of the object, trace the conservation history of the object as well. That's what you're looking at there, um, and you learn a lot by seeing that. You can you can see losses, you can see um, where someone has mucked with it or whatever it is. So. So we did that for two years and then decided to buy it. And so now it's part of the Mets collection. What was this painting? Did it have like a purpose initially? It, it would have been a Zen devotional object. Um, um, this is the this would have been the centerpiece because this is the patriarch of Buddhism, uh, of Zen Buddhism, Bodhidharma, um, the, the person credited with um, transmitting Zen teachings of, from India to China. And so it would have been the, the central piece of a suite of paintings um, uh, worshipped in a monastic context. Um, and interestingly, in this case, not being painted by a Zen painter, but by a professional painter. That's famous. That's sort of what Kano Masanobu is, is most famous yeah. for, is, is a professional painter. Yeah, it is just so interesting. And it really shows how you, as a curator, you need to combine your research skills, you know, and then with you said earlier, exhibition development is one of the big things as a curator you need to do too. So I do think this really demonstrates um, not just those two things you need to do, but also we talked about it a little bit earlier, how you need to network, you know, get into the know, see this being displayed when, learn when it's back on the market. Um, would you say, do you think I'm forgetting to address anything else of the very complicated things you need to do? Can you, can you read the question? <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, I was just gushing about how, you know, this acquisition, convincing the Met to get this, and then the research you do into oh. it, how it's kind of combining all of these skills that you gained, not just your Japanese language skills that IUC gave you, although those are certainly very important, but also as a curator, you need to do research and you need to, you know, develop exhibitions, um, but also you need to have networking and, you know, mm -hmm. getting in touch. Do you, would you say that's the case? Definitely, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, always part of the. It's always part of it, and 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 certainly in Japan, right? We all know the importance of kone, and um, um, maintenance of kone. <laughs> um, so so yeah, that's that's definitely part of it. Yeah. 
I, I'm just really just so amazed with this. Um, could you tell us what you're currently doing at the Met? Like many projects you're working sure. on? To have a little bit of fun uh, with a Mentimeter quiz. Um, for those of you who are new, um, you join Menti uh, either by going to menti.com and typing in this uh, eight digit code. You can use your phone, probably the easiest way to scan the QR code. And we also put a link in the, the chat to join. So I'll give everyone uh, a few minutes to, to, to join the Menti. And we have a couple images um, from Aaron, and we're going to, to ask you uh, some questions about them. And then Aaron will discuss a little bit um, about the different artworks. Okay, we'll wait just a, another minute, 30 seconds. All right. Okay. Um, if anyone's still struggling to join, um, the link is in the chat. Uh, I think we'll go ahead and get started here. Okay. So our first question, uh, there we go. Okay. Uh, don't see if that works. Here we go. We have 20 something people. So it's a tournament. So the faster you answer, the more points you get. So this work by Mori Aya is titled Fisarium or Fisarum. What does it depict? A Chinese cabbage, a fountain, a fungus, or a medusa? So Aaron, this was at the Minneapolis Museum of Art. Is that correct? Yeah, this, this was just a work that I exhibited in that very last exhibition in 2019 by a young uh, Japanese artist. Okay, great. Yes, fungus. Well done. I'm not sure I've ever seen one that looks like quite like that, but... <laughs> oh, that's right. You have to type in, it, type in a name. That was one step. Excellent. Bravo, Nemo, leading the pack. Any other comments about that? that that artwork or that exhibit, Aaron? No. No. That was the uh, women's uh, sculptors. Yes, it was. Yes. Is that right? OK. All right, question number two. So here's an object, uh, a reliquary. Which culture do you think this is from? Japan, Korea, Persia, or Thailand? Quite exquisite. About how big is this, Aaron? About seven inches high. Oh, okay, quite tiny. Uh, okay. Ah, I think we we tricked them a little bit. <laughs> Let's see if I can get the the picture to come back. Uh, oh, no, I think it went back to the last slide. Sorry, it disappeared. Um, but can you tell us a bit about that object? Yeah, yeah. That's a um, it's an eighth century Korean um, gilt bronze reliquary holder, in the shape of a pavilion. And so it it, it originally had a, a glass container with relics in it, and the whole thing would have been buried inside of yet another container, a casket of some kind, and um, um, buried inside of a pagoda. But it's from um, Shilla Dynasty, Korea, in at the Minneapolis Institute of Art. It's amazing that definitely, you know, we've been hearing about this focus on Japan and Chinese works, but obviously when you work for a museum, I guess you you get pulled into all different things. So do you, do you find that to be challenging to sort of expand beyond your, um, your, your area of expertise? Definitely. Korea was was in, in some ways less difficult than expanding to things like ceramics, though, actually. Okay. Interesting. Okay, let's see what's next. Okay, I think we tricked people. I thought with with the gold, the gold plating, the, it looked uh, reminded me of things from Southeast Asia, maybe. Okay, excellent, Travis. Well done. All right, hi Travis. Question three. Uh, Crabs and Peonies by Ito Jakchu is a freestanding screen, also known as what in Japanese? So we have 
すだれついたて屏風、and ふすま。And of course, I'm paranoid I'm getting the intonation wrong on each of these. <laughs> Only at an IUC event would I worry about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. I think this was、uh, Megan's proposed question. I don't, I, I don't know what to say about this one. I think I think that people were confused by the image, which looks like a two panel folding screen, which is a biobu, but actually it's the front and back of a tsuitate. Ah, okay. And I think you told us a bit about this. <laughs> <Yeah> . <laughs> it's,、um, it's the front and back of a painting. So、uh, I can, is the, can the image come back or is it、yeah, okay if it、uh, can't? We can bring it back after this, but I can't see it. Okay, yeah. Yeah. This was this was the most recent painting that、um, uh, that we acquired at the or that I I sort of proposed for acquisition of the Met and it just became、um, part of the collection. But it's a very interesting painting of crabs, a massive painting. This is like six feet high,、uh, a single freestanding screen with crabs on one side and this massive peony being whipped in the wind on the other side by Jacuzzi. We can、uh, share the links to all of these works in the,、uh, yeah. the follow up email. So check your email. We, we'll also send a feedback survey, but we'll, we'll include links to these various works. Well done, a s a n Okay, but Travis maintains his lead. Well done. And, my, and she's also my senpai, Joan. Joan, Joan when and I was responding to the chat. Oh,、uh, Joan? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, she gave, we had a little、uh, gathering of IUC alums in the Chicago area that I organized about, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago. And she hosted us and gave us a tour of the, the galleries in, in Chicago. It's a small collection in Chicago, but it's, it's very lovely. Is it though? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a beautiful museum too. Jan- yes, it's Janice Katz, correct? Janice Katz, yeah. Even older than I am. Okay, let's see. Last question. See, who, see if Travis can maintain his lead here. In this work by Hakuin E. Kaku, what is written on Hote's sack? So we have Kuju,、uh, sorry, Emily, or、uh, not Emily, Megan. Why don't you run through these since you prepared this one? Oh, okay. Fukuju Kaimu Ryo. Fukuju wa Saiko. Fukuju wa Uminari. Fukuju wa Samishi. Kaimu Ryo. Oh, Megan's、Ooh. tricky question succeeded. I am. I am sorry, everyone. I wrote this. You can blame me. Yeah, but who's the one person who got it right? I think we'll find out. There you go. Oh, a s a n and that should be enough to bring a s a n over the top. <laughs> Who is, who's A? Who's A s a n Hope it's not one of our members. <laughs> Aaron? No, it's not me. I'm not, I'm not participating. <laughs> oh, oh, I see. Oh, I know who it was. <laughs> it was Andrew. It was Andrew. Okay, excellent. Okay, well, that's. that's Medito. Was... Go ahead, Andrew. Did you want to? Give us、uh, an indication of how you nailed these. Oh, hi, Aaron. I'm actually、hi. also a PhD student at Columbia, so I'm a co high. <laughs> <laughs> he knows what、so、he's doing. I, <laughs> I, I guess that's why. But thank you for your very interesting、um, talk today, Aaron. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so that's, that's it for me for, for the Menti. I guess I'll pass back to, to Megan if you want to. Lead the、uh, QA. I think we had one or two questions、uh, yeah. from, from the chat. I saw some interesting questions coming in, but here is that Jokuchu, that amazing、oh, yeah. uh, freestanding screen. Someone who mentioned the um, um, Yamazaki Pan、um, uh, collector? Someone, I saw a question in the QA. I, about... I, did, I did, Aaron, Joan Winstein. So, Joan,、um, the triptych that is at the heart of my dissertation and the center of my book manuscript now is in、uh, two rooms, not super long. So, if you,、uh, you know, encounter anyone that you, know, you didn't feel like you had enough time to talk to, 
uh, please do uh, reach out and follow up or or even after the breakout rooms end, you know, feel free to continue talking. Um, before we go into the breakout rooms, uh, we we do like uh, to ask for feedback on these events. Um, we will also send a link uh, via an, an email to everyone here today um, afterwards, as well as the links to the, the artworks. And also we will put uh, this video up on YouTube afterwards. You can see we have about, I think, eight other videos. They're, they're quite long, they're uncut, um, but if you have some time, uh, go, go, go check them out and uh, follow the channel. Um, lastly, um, we're, uh, we have another member of our, our Jima Kyoku team who, who's gotten quite busy. We always have people, people getting ready to leave or leaving as other commitments come up. So if anyone on this call would be interested in exploring, getting involved, please reach out to, to any one of us and we can explain to you what that time commitment, what our schedule looks like. Okay, um, so did I miss anything? Um, if not, I think, uh, uh, yeah, well, once again, we'll give a hakshu for, for Aaron san for uh, his terrific talk and, and sharing with us. And I will give uh, people who don't want to join the breakouts, I'll give you a, a minute to, to leave. And thank you very much for attending. And then I will go ahead and create a couple rooms here.